Hey everyone, welcome to Disciple Dojo. This video, we're gonna do something that a number of viewers have asked about over the past couple of years. How do I build a theological library? People are really getting into Bible study through the efforts of a lot of ministries out there. And it's great because people are starting to dig deeper. They're starting to look for more than just a good sermon every week or a quick devotional. They're really wanting to dig. So I wanted to make a video that will kind of walk through what I think. This is my own personal views. This is not speaking for anybody else. What I think are some good things to keep in mind as you are building your theological library. And speaking of theological library building, when we hit 10,000 subscribers here on the channel, we are going to be giving away an entire set of the Anchor Bible Dictionary. Now, this is just volume six. There's five more behind me back there. But this is one of the premier biblical studies resources out there brand new it cost over a thousand dollars used it's going to cost a couple of hundred dollars we had a friend donate his set to disciple dojo and we're giving it away so all you have to do to enter well we'll talk about that when we get to ten thousand members so do me a favor and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and click the notifications icon Keep an eye out for that giveaway because that's going to be a pretty big celebration. And our goal by the end of the year is to have 20,000 subscribers. So this will be in celebration of hitting the halfway point. We're going to give away the Anchor Bible Dictionary. And now with that out of the way, let's talk about building your own theological library. Now, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, I entered seminary. I went to the same seminary that my dad went to before me, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary up in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. And my first semester there, I had to buy a lot of books. Now, I was an art major in undergrad, so I was not used to buying lots of books. I was used to buying a lot of paint, but I was not used to buying lots and lots of books. And guess what? When you go to seminary, you have to read a lot of books. So I remember talking to my dad when I got my first reading list of my first semester and just saying, one, do you have any of these books in your library at the house? Because my dad has probably three times as many books as I do. And he would look through the list. And if he had any, he would send them to me so that I didn't have to buy them. But I remember him telling me something when I kind of balked at the prices and, and how expensive it was to have theological books. He said, son, if you were a plumber, and people were paying you to come fix things in their plumbing, you wouldn't use bad tools because that would reflect badly on you as a plumber. You would actually invest as a plumber, as a professional, you would invest in the best tools that you could afford to do the best job that you could do. So your job is professional biblical studies, theologian, pastor, teacher, whatever I was going to go into after seminary. YouTuber wasn't even a thing back then. And so he said, don't skimp on your tools. Get the best tools you can and understand that is part of the profession. And it always stuck with me. I really appreciated that advice, among many other things my dad's taught me over the years, because it freed me up from being miserly in terms of spending money on books. Now, there's an excess. I've just finished translating the book of Ecclesiastes, and one of the final warnings that the author gives is that when it comes to making scrolls or books, there's no end and much study can weary the body. So you don't want to go nuts. There are people who have books that they will never, ever, ever read. They just buy them just to collect them and hoard them. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when you're buying books for you to use in your theological capacity, whatever that is, don't apologize for that. You are equipping yourself with the best tools that you're able to get your hands on. Think of it that way. So with that being said, I'm going to walk through a couple of different categories and just give what I think are some helpful starters for anybody looking to build their theological library. These aren't going to be necessarily specific volumes that I recommend. Some will be. Some will just be examples of the type of volumes that I recommend. So keep that in mind. But we're going to go through these in categories. And the first category we're going to look at are theological books, because most people approach biblical studies, theology, ministry through the lens of a non-technical perspective. They start 
by getting into theological studies. And usually then that leads into deeper biblical studies and exegetical digging. Now, I think the order should be reversed personally. I think theology should be the last thing somebody does. I think you should do theology after you've equipped yourself to do biblical exegesis. But I also know just by the nature of things that that's usually not the order people go in. So we're going to start with a couple of recommendations that I think would help you get started towards filling out your theological knowledge a little bit better. Now, the first one that I would recommend every Christian should read, John Stott's Basic Christianity. This is a small volume. These are paperback, mass market. Most A lot of churches give these away, but if you have not read Basic Christianity, I believe this is one of the most important books ever written in the English language for Christians. It's concise. It explains the gospel. There will be some areas where you may theologically have some differences here and there, but overall, I think John Stott does a fantastic job in presenting exactly what the title says, Basic Christianity. So this would be my starting point for anyone looking to understand theology. Now, when it comes to theology, it's important to know that we're not reinventing the wheel. Theology is a conversation with the past. And there's some resources that are good at that. One is Alistair McGrath's The Christian Theology Reader. What McGrath does is he samples theological writings from the ages from a number of different theologians, a number of different perspectives, and he presents them in short, easy to read chunks. Some you've likely never even heard of, some you're very familiar with, John Calvin, John Wesley, Wolfhart Pannenberg on soteriological approaches to Christology. So this is much, much more technical than John Stott's Basic Christianity, but you're getting samples of the different theologians throughout the ages. Here's two by Augustine. So this is a sampling of theology down through the centuries. And for that reason, it's a great addition to your library to get you started in drinking in the vast ocean that is theology. Similarly, Thomas Oden has a set of volumes. This is volume one. It's actually a three volume work. The other two are up on my shelf, but it's uh, his systematic theology, volume one. The first one is called The Living God. The second one is called The Word of Life, and volume three is Life in the Spirit. What Odin does is he goes through and he pulls from the widest possible net that he can and presenting broadly orthodox, with a lowercase o, Christian theology from the earliest centuries of the church on. So he breaks it down into different categories. And in any systematic theology, if you turn to the beginning you'll see the contents and you'll see how they organize it. So part one is the living God. Part two is the reality of God. Part three is the work of God. Part four is the study of God. And then within that, there are different questions. And that's just for volume one. But why I recommend this is because Odin was someone who took a journey into theological heterodoxy early in his career. He veered off into all sorts of modern theological, liberalist, revisionist approaches. And he ended up coming back to a basic Orthodox Christian theology. And it was primarily through reading the earliest followers of Jesus and looking at the history of Christianity as a whole. And this was the result. Again, this is just volume one. There's two more to it. But this is a great series. I typically don't love systematic theology books in general, but if you're going to use a systematic theology, if you want a systematic theology that doesn't tie down to one particular theological tradition, then this and McGrath's readers, this would feed you well starting out in your theological journey. Now, one of the hallmarks of theological study is disagreement. Christians simply will not agree on everything. There are many things Christians will disagree on. And as you drill down deeper into various traditions, you're going to find even more and more differences in those secondary, tertiary, and utterly inessential things. And that's not a bad thing. The only bad thing is when you are only familiar with your tradition, when you're only familiar with the arguments for positions that you actually believe, rather than being exposed to the breadth of what all is out there. And so I want to recommend two resources that I find extremely helpful in navigating theological disagreement. 
The first one is this little book by Greg Boyd and Paul Eddy, and it's called Across the Spectrum, Understanding Issues in Evangelical Theology. And this is a great book because it takes different concepts where Christians disagree and lets the proponents of each of those views argue for and against. So there's the inspiration debate, the providence debate, the foreknowledge debate, the genesis debate, all of these issues where Christians are going to disagree and different systematic theology textbooks will take different views. They've let proponents of those views argue their case and there's no trying to say which one is right in the end. They just let the reader make up their mind. This is a fantastic resource for looking to better understand some of those issues that different churches come to different conclusions on. And in that same vein, another series that's excellent is Zondervan's Counterpoint series. They all look like this in the new editions. And there are like, I don't know, a dozen or two dozen of these. This one is on heaven. So it has four views on heaven and it gives you, these are the contributors, John Feinberg, our friend J. Richard Middleton, Michael Allen, Peter Kreft. And it lets each view, each advocate present their case. And then after they've presented their case, then they get to respond. So here's Richard Middleton's taking the new earth perspective. That's what he's going to argue in his. And so he presents his case. And then at the end, when he's done, then there are responses to his case by each of the other contributors. And then after they've responded, each contributor gets a rejoinder where Richard gets to say, okay, I've listened to these critiques and now this is my follow-up response to the critiques. So this series, and like I said, again, this is just on heaven. This is four views on heaven. Some are three views on something. Some are two views on something. Some are five views on something, depending on what the issue is. This series and books like this are about as close as you're going to get to having rigorous theological discussion short of going to a theological conference or a meeting where people are actually debating it. So I highly recommend these type of resources. There are so many more out there, and literally I've got shelves behind me of other theological resources, systematic, historical, but those type of resources that I just mentioned are good starting places. This video is all about giving you a starting place from then you can go and follow up as things catch your interest. So those are just a few theological resources. There are many, many more out there that are excellent. Now, whereas theological work is concerned with synthesizing thought, with, with taking ideas that are gleaned from Scripture, ultimately, and then presenting them, organizing them, ordering them, and then creating doctrines that can be taught and passed on. That's the work of theology. Biblical studies is the prior step which is why I think biblical studies is what should be done first. Biblical studies, you're looking at how do I read the Bible and understand what it says without reading all my own ideas into it or without making it say something that the biblical authors themselves weren't saying. And that's a daunting challenge. That's the focus of this channel, actually. Disciple Dojo is here primarily to help people do just that. Building their theology comes later, and I leave that up to the theologians and others who are better at that and who have more of an interest in that. My focus here on this channel is helping people navigate biblical studies, and so the bulk of my library, the bulk of my recommendations have to do with biblical studies. So we're going to start with basics and work our way up. Two volumes I think every person should have on their shelf, and these are older editions. The newer ones look different. How to read the Bible for all it's worth and the follow-up how to read the Bible book by book. Both of these are by Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart. Full disclosure, Doug Stewart was one of my professors and I never got a chance to meet Gordon Fee, sadly. But how to read the Bible for all it's worth is basically a simplified version of Fee and Stewart's separate Old Testament exegesis and New Testament exegesis books that are used in seminaries. This condenses that, takes out all the jargon, and presents it for a popular level audience. It breaks up scripture into its different genres. It talks about things like right here, chapter two, the basic tool, a good translation. So there's good discussion about Bible translations in here. Then it moves into the epistles, then the Old Testament narratives, the book of Acts, the gospels, the parables, the law, the prophets, the Psalms, wisdom, and then it ends with revelation. So this takes a genre specific walk through the Bible 
and it gives you concepts on how to read the different parts of Scripture because the Bible is not a flat book. It's not even a book. It's a library, and you read different books with different lenses. So hugely helpful. And in fact, our course here at Disciple Dojo, Bible for the Rest of Us, is largely influenced by this book, this specific book. So if you haven't taken that course, it's entirely free. I'll put a link in the description below. You, your church, your small group, your Sunday school class, your campus ministry, any of you can use it. But the ideas from it come in a large part from how to read the Bible for all it's worth. How to read the Bible book by book takes these concepts and applies them to each book of the Bible. So it's going to start the narrative of Israel, and then it's going to go through Genesis. And it's going to give you some tips on how do you best make sense of Genesis. And then it's going to go to Exodus and then Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua. So this is something of a commentary. It's not a full commentary. It doesn't walk through the books verse by verse. But this is like if you collected all of the book introductions from a really good study Bible and then expanded them to about five to ten pages, that's what you would have here. So these two together highly recommended. Then beyond that, how do you make the jump from what you're reading in scripture to the modern setting where you find yourself today? That's where this book comes in handy, Grasping God's Word. This is by Scott Duvall and Daniel Hayes, and this is a textbook. This is a basic biblical interpretation hermeneutics textbook. So it's going to look a little more daunting, but it's super simple. It's all based on this concept, the interpretive journey, that when you read scripture, you're going back into another world and you're looking around and you're taking note and you're seeing what you see. It's got examples of how to do note taking in the Bible. You're making observations. You're noting the different contexts of what you're reading, like the word the immediate context, the same book, the same author, other books in that testament, and then the rest of the Bible. So you're getting familiar with the biblical world by studying it, and then you cross back over what they call the principalizing bridge. You bring the principles and the concepts from this world of the text back into the world where we are today, the modern world. And sometimes there's an easy one-to-one -one application, like do not murder. Sometimes there's a principle you have to pull out from a passage that meant one thing here, like do not muzzle your ox while it treads out the grain, and applies in a very different way in modern settings, which in the case of that verse, Paul applied to providing for the material needs of people who are working for the gospel. So grasping God's word is sort of an overall study, a course on how to do that how to get the most out of Scripture, and how to not read things into Scripture, which is always one of the biggest dangers. So three great books on hermeneutics that I would recommend be on your shelf. Now, one of the key things needed for in-depth biblical study, and I mean like really, really deep, is understanding the biblical languages. There's just no way around it. If you saw our last video here on the channel where I responded to a KJV only uh, commenter, you can't get around having access to the languages. Now, that doesn't mean that every Christian has to learn Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. But what it does mean is that you have to know that you don't know Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, and you have to be aware of misusing Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And that in and of itself can be a real challenge, even to seasoned preachers. So here are some resources that will help in that regard. There are two volumes, Hebrew for the rest of us and Greek for the rest of us. This one's by Lee Fields. This one's by Bill Mounts. These are basically, uh, the tagline here, using Hebrew tools without mastering biblical Hebrew. And then the same one here, mastering Bible study without mastering biblical languages. This tagline, I think, is a little uh, grandiose. I think this one is much more realistic. You're not going to ever master Bible study, even if you know the languages. So marketing department, I blame them for that. But you can be able to use biblical languages tools, even if you don't know the language, if you have a degree of familiarity with the language. And that's what these volumes do. They introduce you to the basics of the language. You learn how to pronounce things. You learn how to spell. You learn what the different versions 
of a particular text are. In the case of Hebrew, you learn how to recognize roots and stems. You learn a little bit how the cases function, how the tenses of the verb affect meaning. So you're basically learning how biblical Hebrew works without having to actually learn the language, be fluent in it, learn all the vocabulary, all of that kind of stuff. And the same with Mounts' Greek for the rest of us. You're learning about the different morphologies, the different way words change based on tense, mood, aspect. You learn a little bit about the text, like how Greek was actually written. And then since Greek is a highly inflected language where the tenses of the verbs do most of the heavy lifting, there's a chapter on each verb tense as well. So you can understand when you're reading in a commentary and they mention the aorist and the imperfect tense and just assume that the reader knows what those are and what the significance is, you can have an idea at least of what they're talking about, even if you can't parse the word yourself. So I recommend both of these, at least having on the shelf and having read through once for yourself. Now, there is a danger in studying the biblical languages, and that danger is you misuse the biblical languages. Just like handing a toddler a sharpened katana or giving a four-year-old a loaded AR-15, those are not good ideas. Putting a seven-year-old behind the wheel of a bulldozer. You're learning powerful things when you learn the languages, and powerful things can easily be misused, even by people who know in theory how they work. So for that reason, I just want to quickly mention a resource that I think is an absolute must for anyone studying the biblical languages, and that is D.A. Carson's Exegetical Fallacies. This is not a thick book. It's very short, but this is basically a handbook on how not to use the biblical languages, how not to interpret scripture. And bonus points, Carson himself even quotes some of his earlier work where he made some of these fallacies. Definitely check this out. If you've seen our superhero seminary video with Professor He-Man, he talks all about this kind of stuff. It's very important. And when I finished my first year of Greek way back, 20 something years ago in seminary, our professor at the end of the class, after we'd taken our final last day, said, congratulations, you've worked hard, you've studied hard, you now know just enough Greek to successfully start your own cult. And that's always stuck with me because that's how cults work. All of the various cults and cultish splinter groups uh, that, that split off from mainstream Christianity over some minute doctrinal point or some esoteric meaning of the text whether it's sacred name stuff, whether it's Black Hebrew Israelite stuff, whether it's some of the more like straight up cults that are out there that use Christian language. All of those aberrant teachings usually stem from somebody being able to convince listeners that they have a secret insight into the text. And many times, not all the time, but many times that secret insight is based on supposed hidden meanings in the Hebrew or the Greek. Spend five minutes on TikTok and you'll see all kinds of nonsense that people pass around like it's some new secret when it's really just fallacious. So how do we keep from veering into exegetical fallacies? How do we handle passages of scripture that are difficult or where Christians have differing views on them, on specifics of the passage, where the exegesis of a particular passage can yield different results. What do we do then? 